I wanted to preach today about intercession for the lost and my message in the message of drawing near. I want to I just want to read from from the book that that the Lord gave me on an unchangeable and breakable and stoppable joy because it was really the highlight of this message and it's going to take about about 3 3 to 5 minutes to read this chapter about intercession. How many have loved ones that you care about and you want to see saved? I was going to preach on Genesis 18 where the Lord visited Abraham and he was going to to judge Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham knew that his his nephew and his family were there in Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham began to plead with the Lord and the two angels you can read it in in Genesis chapter 18 and the Lord is is endeavoring I believe to teach us about the harvest and what's on his heart we sing songs about what's on the Lord's heart let me tell you what's on his heart you others and the lost that's what's on his heart you don't have to guess about it it's you and the lost he said i have come to seek and to save that which is lost it tells us in genesis 18 verse 20 i'll read this passage of scripture i want to I want you to see how abraham drew near to god in this moment they were going to judge they were going to judge sodom and gomorrah It says in verse 20, And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see. Now the Lord appeared to him in in physical form. This is called a Christophany. This is an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament, of course, before he came as a babe in a manger. How many know that he is the eternal one? He's always existed. Jesus has always existed. And I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know, the Lord says to Abraham. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom. Remember, they had come to Abraham. Abraham kind of entertained them a little bit with some. He washed their feet. There are two angels in the Lord, and they they ate a little bit, and they refreshed themselves, and then it was time for them to go to Sodom and Gomorrah and judge it to see what was happening there. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. In other words, Abraham stood between the sinner and God. That's a place of intercession. Did you know Jesus is an intercessor for us? He intercedes for us. He loves us. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for the ungodly. And so that's all of us. That's all of us. I mean, no, it isn't just about certain sins. It's all sins that Jesus wants to forgive and cleanse. Abraham stood before the Lord. In other words, they stood up to go, and Abraham got in front of them between Sodom and the Lord and the angels. And this is what it says. I love verse 23. And Abraham came near. Everybody say came near. See, coming near to God is just not about only worshiping him, and he loves when we worship. Somebody say amen. But it is also about intercession. And this is what Abraham said when he, you can just see him just come a little bit closer to the Lord and say, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? And of course, the Lord, his answer is no. And you can read this entire chapter. Abraham starts with 50. If there's 50 righteous, the Lord said, no, I'll not, I'll not destroy it. Well, what if there's 45? And he starts, he starts bringing down the number. He wasn't too confident in Sodom and Gomorrah, I'm just telling you that. He wasn't too confident. But he was, and he got it all the way down to 10, and there wasn't even 10. And so the Lord rescued Lot. We know the story. But it is a picture of intercession. It's a picture of how we talk to God as a friend for the lost. And how we plead with him. And the Lord gave me a chapter in this book 
unchangeable, unbreakable, unstoppable joy. And I want to read it to you. It's very short, but it's the joy of brokenness is what it, what the chapter is, the joy of brokenness. Now, that sounds like a paradox, but you're going to see that it's so powerful. Psalm 20, uh, 126, verses 5 and 6, this is what it says to start the chapter. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with us. Lord, teach us to stand in the gap for the lost, Lord, like we've never done. The harvest is here. The harvest is here. We we must get busy in prayer about it. And, Lord, if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, I pray that they will before they leave here. Or if they're backslidden, Lord, I pray that they will come to you today. This is what it says. In Christ, brokenness is a blessing. Humility brings promotion. And meekness and lowliness are rewarded. Tears are honored in the kingdom of God. They are not despised. Tears are not a sign of weakness, but rather a sign of strength, conviction, and compassion. Weeping is remembered by God. Tears are stored in his bottle of hope and written about in his books. When you cry to God, your enemies face defeat. The psalmist writes, quote, Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will be turned back. This I know because God is for me. Psalm 56, 8 and 9. Again, the psalmist says, For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Psalm 51, verses 16 through 17. Tears are what we sow in the presence of God when we are asking heartfelt things of him. For souls to be saved, people to be healed, loved ones to be delivered. Weeping is the measure of triumph. Brokenness of soul. I'll get it. Is a powerful, meaningful, powerfully meaningful message to God. Tears demonstrate your anguish and your compassion before God, before the God of all compassion. See, I think in the church we have lost something of weeping for the loss over the years. It goes on, groanings from your spirit are desired in the throne room of your heavenly Father. His son poured out his soul in anguish as an offering for the sin of others. And at times, you must do the same for others. Isaiah wrote, quote, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand, unquote. Isaiah 53, a prophecy about Jesus, verse 10. Our great intercessor, Jesus Christ, was heard by God the Father and by man weeping in the days of his flesh. The word tells us, quote, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because his godly fear 
Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Unquote. Hebrews 5, verses 7 through 9. Tears are a language that your heavenly Father and your Savior know very well. That's why the psalmist writes, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Tears are powerful seeds that come from the heart of the child of light. Into the darkness of a sinful world they fall, bright with the hope of the gospel's power to save, heal, and fill people with the Holy Spirit. When tears flow from the heart of a child of God, sons and daughters of God are born again. Nothing from hell can stop the blessing that brokenness brings forth in the sight of God. When you are armed with tears, demons tremble. As lambs among wolves, the child of God goes forth bearing the gospel and sowing it with tears. Your tears are a sign, not a sign of regret. They are a sign of surrender. Surrender to the will of the Father to seek and to save the lost. With tears you are sent to those who have never heard the good news and to those who have never experienced the God of love. You plant the seed of the gospel with your tears and water it with the same. And it's in the, this process of brokenness and planting that the Father whispers, it's only a matter of time, and the answer will come. The Father plans. He plans it this way. Tears and brokenness precede and expedite the harvest. Paul the Apostle wrote, I planted, oh, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his labor, unquote. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6 through 8. A harvest of souls awaits those who sow the gospel with tears. Many are swept into the kingdom of God through rivers of tears. When the child of God embraces brokenness for the lost, the lost will be saved. For those who sow in tears will reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing precious seed, and doubt will doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Let that truth of the, let the truth of these words burn in your heart like a fire. If you are burdened about eternal des the, the eternal destiny of loved ones and friends, you need not feel helpless to see them saved. Do you have tears? Then you have power with God and seed to sow. Sow your tears in the eternal soil of God's love for the lost. Sow them today. Sow them tomorrow and the next day and the next. Go with tears to your prayer closet and go forth with the gospel in your heart. You will doubtless return with joy, bringing your sheaves with you. Precious souls, who you love, one to Christ. Stand with me. Come on. Come on up here, Tara and worship team. Hallelujah. Does that make sense? Yes. I've noticed in this new age of Christian pursuits that we have failed to pursue this part of the heart of God. And I want to read the declaration at the end of this chapter. And I want you to repeat it with me. It's, it's fairly lengthy, uh, maybe a paragraph. It's, it's a lot longer than most of my declarations. But I want you to get this in your heart. And remember, you do not have to feel powerless to see your loved ones saved. Tears and faith 
will bring it to pass. Say this after me. Heavenly Father, I pray the words of the prophet Jeremiah. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears that I may weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Jeremiah 9, 1. Let my hardness be turned to weeping for the lost in my family, among my friends and neighbors. Awaken your burden in me for those who are helpless and hopeless against Satan's bondage. Break my heart for those who are sick and afflicted without soundness and wholeness in their body. Jesus, you are the Savior. You are the healer. Let your compassion move me like it moved you. Let tears be my glad portion until souls come home to you. And the house of God is filled. Let the harvest you've determined come forth with weeping and with gladness. And I will give you all the praise. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. And everyone said, amen. Come on, give the Lord praise right now.